Chapter 11 is entitled The Frankest Elite. The Frankest Elite consisted of a circle of very gifted intellectuals, theologians, and men of letters, as well as a group of men of great financial means, who were for the most part great merchant bankers and exerted tremendous influence in their day in the highest financial circles of Europe. The most logical place to discover these people and their machinations would be to investigate Frank's own family and whom they married, bearing in mind, as we have noted before, that the Frankest only married among themselves. As the circle of this elite widens, we find that they were in intimate contact with others, whom we cannot document as being Frankists, but whose actions indeed at least conform to the Frankist pattern of behavior. One such individual belonging to this latter category is Israel Jacobson, 1768 to 1828, as we examine the Dubrushka family, we find that they intermarried with other people of great financial means, and that there was evidence of Frankism in those families, as well as mass conversion to Christianity. For example, Moses Dubrushka himself married the niece of Joachim Popper, 1720-1795, who was a merchant banker. Francesca Dubrushka, his sister, married into the Honig family, later ennobled as the von Honingsbergs. The Honingsberg family acquired most of its wealth as descendants of Lobel Honig, who, during the Austrian secessions of 1740 to 1748 and the Seven Year War of 1756 to 1763, accumulated a fantastic fortune as a supplier of the Austrian army. Lobel's eldest son, Israel Honig, 1724 to 1808, achieved control of the Austrian tobacco monopoly. Joseph II, Emperor of Austria, incorporated the monopoly in 1784 as a government corporation and retained Israel as a director, thus making Israel Honig the first Jew to become an Austrian official. Israel's partner in the tobacco business was his brother Aaron Moses, 1730-1787. His little brother Aaron Moses had ten children, all of whom were baptized in 1796 after his passing. Israel himself had six sons and one daughter. One of his sons, Leopold, 1744-1815, to 1815, married the daughter of Jonas Wehi, the Frankist leader of Prague, prominent in the reform movement. Leopold was an active Frankist and complained to the Prague police, accusing the rabbis of religious coercion and requesting protection. He sought constantly to undermine, by deception, rabbinical authority, and authorized a 32-page protest in Prague, which was similar in its anti-Semitic character to the aforementioned writings of Zalkind Auerwitz. Leopold Honingsberg's brother-in-law was Rabbi Wolf Ibeschutz, the son of Jonathan Ibeschutz, who married another daughter of Jonas Wehi. Now, Jonas Wehi, 1752 to 1823, in addition to being pivotal in his influence, he was an outstanding aristocrat in Prague. He had a nephew named Gottlieb Wehi, who was also a very prominent Sebastian. Gottlieb Wehi came to the United States with a large constituency of Frankists from Bohemia and Moravia after the revolution in 1848. A will which he left in 1881 was the subject of a chapter in Gershom Sholem's book, The Messianic Idea in Judaism. And we learn from Sholem that this Gottlieb Wehi was the great uncle of the late Justice Louis Dembitz Brandis and a first cousin of Zacharias Frankel. We met Zacharias, or Zechariah, Frankel in Part 1, as the founder of the conservative movement in Germany. Zacharias Frankel was born in Prague on July 7, 1802, and Gottlieb Wehi 20 days later on July 27. Louis Dembitz Brandis's grandfather, named Dembitz, was a student of medicine when he became active with the Frankists. Dembitz's son was Louis Naftali Dembitz, 1833-1907, who was an ardent abolitionist and was one of the nominators of Lincoln at the Republican Convention in 1860. Dembitz is described as an observant and religious Jew who was completely out of character with the behavior of the Frankist Fortiators who arrived in the United States. Louis Brandis himself appeared to be at odds with the interests of the international bankers of his day. For example, he was an ardent Zionist, and Jacob Schiff in 1907 declared that one could not at the same time be a true American and an honest adherent of the Zionist movement. While Brandeis held that, to be good Americans, we must be better Jews, and to be better Jews, we must become Zionists. While it is difficult to show any connection on the part of Justice Brandeis with the Frankists, it is no mere accident that Brandeis University was the headquarters of all SDS chapters throughout the United States, from which their most radical upheavals and riots were masterminded. 
The founders of Brandeis University and some of its top administrators have been violently anti-religious and have left-wing associations. We shall deal with this group in the future chapter, but suffice it to say that Louis Dembitz Brandeis's nameplace held him a position similar to the fictitious Rosemary of Rosemary's Baby. And while he never actually had anything to do with Frankism, radical revolutionaries have utilized his name as a rallying point because of its radical Frankist connections. Jonah Wahey's brother, Aaron Beer Wahey, 1750-1825, was Gottlieb Wahey's father and was also a prominent Frankist. Aaron's sister, Roselle Iger, she died in 1831, she was a prophetess in the movement. Eva Frank, in 1816, shortly before her death, presented a picture of herself in miniature to Aaron, which is presently a part of the Schwadron collection of portraits and autographs in the Hebrew University Library. Aaron Wahey married Esther, 1772 to 1838, who was his second wife and who bore him Gottlieb in 1802. She was the daughter of Berman Simon Frankel Spiro, grandfather of Zacharias Frankel. Rabbi Jacob Emden accused Esther's mother of Sebastian learnings. Esther married Aaron Wahey in 1791. It is interesting to note that Justice Brandeis's wife was also of Frankist ancestry, a fact which appears to have escaped Gershom Scholem, and this double Frankist association may well have helped him rise in America's social spheres to the Supreme Court. Brandeis married one of Gottlieb Wahey's granddaughters, and her sister married Felix Adler, the Geiger Seminary graduate whom we described in Part 1, and who founded Ethical Culture. The Asiatic Brethren, Illuminati Lodge, to which we have previously referred, founded by Moses alias Dabrushka, Schoenfeld in 1782, was a meeting ground for many Frankists in Vienna. The goings-on in the lodge were documented in a chapter entitled The Order of the Asiatic Brethren, which comprises a comprehensive book, Jews and Freemasons in Europe, 1723 to 1939, by Jacob Katz. It should be pointed out that when attempts were made by the Illuminati, Jacobins, and Frankists to infiltrate the Masons, that their infiltration did not mean that they harbored any particular love for Freemasonry. On the contrary, they hated it with a passion and only wished to utilize the cover of Freemasonry as a means of spreading their revolutionary doctrines and to provide a place where they could covertly meet without arousing suspicion. The Order of Asiatic Brethren's full name was De Bruder St. Johannes de Evangelistine aus Asian. From Katz, we learn that this order was the earliest attempt to found a Masonic order with the avowed purpose of accepting both Jews and Christians in its ranks. As usual, the revolutionaries had a legitimate issue to exploit, which they could pervert to their own ends. The legitimate issue was civil rights for Jews and the exclusion of Jews from Masonic orders. This parallels Jacobin attempts at the time of the French Revolution to begin pioneering work with blacks who were disenfranchised as slaves or second-class citizens in European lands and to exploit them for their own ends, such as the Jacobin-sponsored Société des Amis des Noirs, the Society of the Friends of the Blacks. The Illuminati lodges established themselves a reputation for being tolerant and not bigoted, and hence filled themselves up with Jews, but Jews were not allowed into the Illuminati inner sanctum until the 19th century. Katz names many members of the Viennese Asiatic Brethren. He mentions that one of the Honigs belonged, and one gentleman named Nathan Adam Arnstein, 1748 to 1838. Arnstein was a brother-in-law of Isaac Daniel Itzig of Berlin, who was the brother-in-law of David Friedlander of Moses Mendelssohn's circle. Itzig was co-founder with Friedlander of the Jewish Free School in Berlin. Interestingly enough, this school had its own printing press known as the Press of the Jewish Free School, which in 1796 changed its name to the Oriental Printing Office and was considered to be a powerful instrument of cultural reform. Itzig was financial advisor to King Frederick William II of Prussia, who, when he was crown prince, was a member of the Berlin Illuminati. Born in 1744, he became king in 1786. The Asiatic Brethren Illuminati Aberration had lodges in Prague, Innsbruck, Berlin, Frankfurt, and Hamburg. Itzig was a member of the Berlin Asiatic Brethren. Arnstein's brother-in-law was also a member of the Vienna Lodge. His name was Bernard von Eskels, 1753 to 1839. Eskels married Itzig's sister, Cecilia. 
Arnstein's wife was known as the Baroness Fanny. His daughter Charlotte became the wife of Matternick's chief banker, Leopold Elder von Hertz, 1767-1828. Her cousin, son of Solomon and Maria Anna Arnstein, uh, Leopold and five of his children embraced Christianity in 1819. When Frederick William II wished it to be forgotten after assuming the throne that he was an Illuminatus, it was public knowledge that he was given to Rosicrucian mysticism. In 1790, the Tolerance Lodge was founded in Berlin by prominent German-Jewish financiers. They approached the Grand Lodge of Germany to grant them an approved constitution, but their request was refused. The banker Itzig was able to procure a letter of approval from King Frederick William, and the king consented to tolerate the lodge in question and to protect it as long as it harbored no tendencies towards Illuminatismus and towards Enlightenment. Katz informs us that Illuminatismus means an order which has gained notoriety for social and political extremism. So we see that the King of Prussia, Frederick William II, also tried to lead a double life, outwardly a man of conservative views, but inwardly a radical. We can also learn from these royal pronouncements that Enlightenment and Illuminatism, they were basically synonymous. At this point, we may well ask ourselves what Frederick William had to gain from this type of activity in terms of his own self-interest, which would be the throne of Prussia. Aside from any ego satisfaction which he may have harbored as a prince or magus king of the enlightened organization, or belief in the immortality of his soul, as preached by Plato in his Phaedon, so that he would reign two centuries later over the new Platonic Republic, there is another consideration which we may derive from another monarchical predecessor to Frederick William. This monarch was none other than Cavid I, 449 to 531, ruler of Persia. Cavid was in constant conflict with his nobility. They were seeking ways to depose him when Cavid engineered a political solution to his crisis. He thus sought out the communist teacher Mazdak and clandestinely supported him. Mazdak engaged in guerrilla warfare against the nobility and embroiled the Persian Empire in class warfare. Cavid just sat back and watched as the hordes of Mazdak overran some of Persia's major economic centers, killing out the nobility's police and armies. In the process, Mazdak managed to confiscate nobility monies and some of their wives, which he distributed among his followers according to the tenets of his communist teachings of community property. During the Mazdak uprisings, the Jews as entrepreneurs suffered terribly, losing their hard-earned fortunes, businesses, lives, and the chastity of their wives and daughters. While all hopes seemed to be lost, Marzutra the second who was exilarch or chief of the Jewish community, succeeded in organizing the Jewish community under arms. Marzutra's army began to turn the tide and reigned victorious. Marzutra was ennobled by popular acclaim because of his victories. The successes of Marzutra drove the Mazdakites to desperation. They attempted to assassinate him in his castle on one occasion. Finally, in the year 520, they succeeded in inflicting heavy casualties on Marzutra's army, which now comprised non-Jews as well, and during one fierce battle, captured him and crucified him to death. On the day of his death, Marzutra's wife gave birth to Marzutra III and left immediately after his birth for Jerusalem. Marzutra III left his impact on Jewish history as editor of the Jerusalem Talmud. We thus have the ironic precedent of a great Talmudic authority, Marzutra II, exilarch and father of a Talmudic editor fighting communism in the diaspora, risking his life, and finally being tortured to death by crucifixion, nearly 1,500 years before John Birch, the missionary who was tortured by communist Chinese, after whom the Birch Society got its name. Nine years after the death of Marzutra II, Cavid, with the aid of his favorite son, Chosero, implemented an edict of extermination against the Mazdakites. Mazdak himself was hanged, bringing to an end the communist reign of terror. Kavid's kingdom was now united and intact without threats from aspiring noblemen. Communism had served Kavid well. While Frederick William did not rule an aspiring nobility, he was surrounded with independent neighboring German states, which at various times since their inception had grown at the expense of their neighbors or had diminished to their neighbors' advantage. 
If Prussia could succeed in carving out a unified German Republic by stepping in as a conqueror of her neighboring states to quell their internal strifes, it would be worth the risk. In any event, both Prussia under Frederick William and Austria under Joseph II played this political game and were the principal stage upon which the Frankist elite practiced their machinations prior to the French revolutions, and it was in Berlin's Asiatic brethren that the Itzig family reigned supreme. By just following the Itzig family alone, one can trace through these marriages and social circles most of the Illuminati Frankist political intrigues of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Isaac Daniel Itzig, 1750-1806, was the son of Daniel Jaffe, 1723-1799. to 1799. In addition to being distinguished bankers, the Itzigs were purveyors of silver to the Royal Prussian Mint. Daniel, together with banker merchant H. Ephraim, 1703-1753, during the Seven Years' War, issued debased coinage, which not only contributed to inflation, but helped the Prussian government fight the war. Ephraim never lived to see his grandson David, 1762-1834, who further cemented the Ephraim Itzig Consortium by marrying one of Daniel's 12 children. Daniel's daughter Leah married B. Seligman, 1771-1815, progenitor of Joseph Seligman of Our Crowd, who was president of Felix Adler's leftist Ethical Culture Society, and considered himself a free thinker, but in reality, he was an atheist. Felix Adler's wife, as we mentioned before, was the sister-in-law of Louis Dembitz Brandis and the daughter of Joseph Goldmark, 1819 to 1881, who was born in Warsaw. A radical communist in the Austrian Revolution in 1848, he was president of the Student Union and conspired to murder the Austrian Minister of War, Latour, he escaped to America and was sentenced to death in absentia for his part in Latour's death. By 1868, Marxist radicals had gotten so in control of Austria that when Joseph returned to Austria, he was acquitted for his role in the Latour murder. Joseph married the daughter of Frankist Gottlieb Wehi. His son, Henry, 1857 to 1941, he designed the locks on the Panama Canal and his daughter, Pauline, 1874 to 1962, she was a prominent social worker and the secretary of the National Consumer Leagues. It was Daniel Itzig's daughter, Bloomchen, 1752 to 1814, who married David Friedlander of the Mendelssohn Circle and who participated in the heretical Buyer, B-I-U-R, the German translation of the Torah. However, Friedlander's advocations were not lightly regarded by the Itzig clan. Naftali Hertzt Wetzel, or Wesserly in some texts, 1725-1805, contributed the Leviticus commentary to the Boyer. He was an alumnus of one of Rabbi Jonathan Ibeschutz's seminaries, which as early as 1726 had been placed under a rabbinical ban for their Salvation teachings. Ibeschutz had established such seminaries in cities where he sojourned, such as Prague and Aitona. The guy on Rabbi Moses Chagiz, or Hagiz in some texts, 1672 to 1751, had, for example, in a letter dated 19 Tishrei, or October 15th, 1726, he proclaimed, They shall proclaim a strict ban that would prohibit any student from Poland to study under Rabbi Jonathan from Prague. Rabbi Jacob Joshua Falk, 1680 to 1756, author of the monumental Ne Yehoshua Talmudic Commentary, he excommunicated Ibeschutz in 1752. When he conspired to introduce a radical compulsory secular education for Jewish children under Joseph II, Weissel published a book in 1782 entitled Divre Sholem Ve'ernit, or Words of Peace and Truth, to support this position. Rabbi H. Lewin, chief rabbi of Berlin, proceeded to place a ban on the book, but had pressure put on him by the Itzigs, who thwarted it. The Arnsteins introduced Weissel to the Trieste community, that's in Italy, and financially aided Mendelssohn's Boyer project. Nathan Adam Arnstein, 1748-1838, had three brothers, Joseph Michael, 1758-1811, Meyer, and David Isaac. Joseph became a Catholic in 1778 and was disowned by his father, Adam Isaac, 
1721 to 1785, but was ennobled in 1783. His brother Meyer married Teresa Wertheimer, granddaughter of banker chief Rabbi Samson Wertheimer of Austria. Adam's grandfather, Aaron, 1682 to 1744, was employed by Rabbi Wertheimer. Rabbi Wertheimer, 1658 to 1724, was considered to be the wealthiest Jew in Europe from 1694 to 1704. He was financial administrator of emperors Leopold I, Joseph I, and Charles VI, and supervised their diplomatic missions. This earned him the nickname Judenkaiser, or Jewish Emperor. In addition to the family ties of Arnstein and Eskels via marriage in the Itzig family, the two families were connected by marriage through the Wertheimers. For Bernard Gabriel Eskels, 1692 to 1753, married Wertheimer's daughter, who gave birth after his death to their son Bernard, 1753 to 1839, who married Cecilia Itzig. The Arnsteins and Eskels were involved in a clandestine political intrigue aimed at political revolution and were active Illuminati. Their main base of operation was the Asiatic Brethren Lodge in Vienna. From there, they executed what is described as the worst piece of legislation leading to Jewish assimilation, namely the Tolerance Patent, or the Etic of Tolerance, of Joseph II. The Tolerance Patent intrigue was kicked off by the appearance of an anonymous expose illustrating the alleged backwardness of Austrian Jewry. The anonymous authorship has been ascribed by historians to Bernard Eskels. This led to Joseph II's patent of tolerance on January 2, 1782. In 1788, Joseph ordered the Jews to divest themselves of laws and customs that ran counter to his enlightened imperial legislation. Bernard's sister Leah, meanwhile, was engaged in high espionage and was involved in a Prussian spy scandal. She married Valentine Gunther of the court of Joseph II. Bernard's wife Cecilia and her sister, the Baroness Fanny von Arnstein, 1757-1818, opened salons and ballrooms that were all the rage of Vienna. The two sisters tried to outdo each other in their extravagant parties and libertine escapades. Fanny bankrolled Mozart and introduced to Vienna the first Christmas tree. Cecilia flirted with the Illuminatist humanist Goethe, and her sister-in-law, Leah Gunther, corresponded with Goethe regularly. Not to be outdone by Cecilia, Fanny enticed the Count of Liechtenstein to duel for her honor. He was killed. During the Congress of Vienna, Metternich, Hardenberg, and Talleyrand danced in her ballrooms, which became a center of political intrigue. Her daughter, Henrietta, married banker Heinrich Pereira, 1774 to 1835, whose family converted to Christianity. Arnstein and Eskels both financed the Tyrolese peasant revolt against France and Bavaria. Fanny's nephew, Benedict David Arnstein, 1765 to 1841, son of David Isaac, entered the banking business and was held in high esteem in Viennese society as a writer dramatist. His first publication, an Illuminati propaganda piece, describes the joy felt by Jewish families of Austria at the issue of the Tolerance Edict. The banking houses of Arnstein and Eskels both eventually ended in financial ruin in the early 19th century as their wealth passed on to the increasing competition of the Rothschild dynasty and their religion, which they had long ago renounced in practice and belief, officially changed her Christianity, such as in the case of Cecilia Eskels, whose entire family was baptized in 1824. When Fanny Arnstein died, she endowed the home of the aged for Catholic priests of Vienna and was eulogized by none other than N. H. Homburg, 1749-1841, whom we met as a conspirator with Lilienthal and Geiger in Part 1. Homburg was a collaborator with Mendelssohn's Boyer on the Deuteronomy translation. Mendelssohn considered Homburg competent enough to tutor his son Joseph. There is no doubt about the Frankist rights of the Asiatic Brethren Lodge and their esteem of the all-seeing eye. The Asiatic Brethren adopted Christian symbols and were required to eat pork and milk. Professor Sholem has proven that the Brethren were dominated by Sebastian conceptions. While Dabrushka, founder of the Viennese Asiatic Lodge, went to an early death, Ephraim Joseph Hirschfeld, 1755 to 1820, a Frankist and activist in Mendelssohn's circle, 
was active with the Vienna Lodge and was a missionary for the Asiatic Brethren. He was described as its, quote, central spiritual pillar, end quote. Hirschfeld preached that he who occupied himself with Kabbalah could pass beyond the confines of Catholic, Muslim, or Jewish religions and reach the one and only true, pure, and overall religion. From 1792 until his death in 1820, Hirschfeld settled in Offenbach, seat of the Frankists, where he devoted much of his time to their activities. A close acquaintance of Hirschfeld was Franz Joseph Molitor, who was historian for the Vienna Lodge. In 1812, Molitor, 1779 to 1860, who was a Christian with Frankist leanings, became head of the Jewish Freemasonry Lodge in Frankfurt, which had illuminastic tendencies. He invited Hirschfeld to introduce Asiatic rites, but this was rejected by the lodge, especially since that lodge had been charted prior to Napoleon's defeat by the Illuminati's Grand Orient Lodge of Paris and made it suspect. Molitor revered Frankist Jonathan Ibeschutz and stated that Moses Schoenfeld was Ibeschutz's grandson. We know this is not true, taking family pedigree at face value, although the possibility of this being the illegitimate grandson is within reason, while it is known that Wolf Ibeschutz visited the Debruschka homestead in Brno and that adultery was frequently practiced by them and even respectable rabbis who were crypto -sebations. What comes through discounting this possibility is Ibeschutz's influence in this circle that caused the Lodge to feel proudly associated with him, especially Ibeschutz's nihilistic antinomian work of Viavo Heoim El Hayeen, or I Shall Approach the Eye Today. Ibeschutz's sinister allusions in this book found representation in Weishaupt's Illuminati, not only in the all seeing eye, but in other symbols such as the point in a circle denoting the fecundity principle and sexual anarchy, which is still in use by today's continuation of the Frankists, the Platonic communist cult of the all-seeing eye. In the wake of the Illuministic German-Jewish Freemasonry lodges, we find that the Rothschilds very adroitly steered their way into a position of control over these lodges in much of the same manner as Frederick, the Duke of Brunswick, member of the Illuminati, was one of the main sponsors of the Vienna Asiatic Brethren Lodge until his death in 1792. The Rothschilds utilized the services of Sigmund Geisenheimer, their head clerk, who in turn was aided by Itzig of Berlin, the Illuminati of the Tolerance Lodge, and the Parisian Grand Orient Lodge. Geisenheimer was a member of the Mayence Masonic Illuminati Lodge and was the founder of the Frankfurt Judenloge, for which attempt he was excommunicated by the chief rabbi of Frankfurt, Svi Hirsch Horowitz. At a later date, the Rothschilds joined the lodge. Solomon Meyer Rothschild, 1774-1855, was a member for a short while before moving to Vienna. While the Frankists established themselves in 1786 in the Frankfurt suburb of Offenbach and were patronized by unidentified philanthropists of the Frankfurt community, the author is at a loss to find any documents related to the Rothschilds with the Frankists. At the time of Jacob Frank's death in 1791, Amschel Meyer Rothschild, the oldest of the five Rothschild children, was 18, and James, the youngest, had not even yet been born. During the Frankfurt Lodge's formative years, the three most active members of the Frankfurt Judenloge were Geisenheimer, Michael Hess, 1782 to 1860, and Justice Hiller. Michael Hess was hired by Meyer Amschel Rothschild, 1744 to 1812, as a tutor for his children. Hess also tried to close a Jewish religious school in 1816. Sigmund Geisenheimer distinguished himself as a founder of Philanthropen, the first school of reform Judaism. The Frankfurt Judenloge was the headquarters of leaders of the early reform movement, including Michael Hess himself, Michael Kreisenbach, the historian Marcus Jost, and Jacob Auerbach, who aided Lilienthal in his aborted campaign against Russian Jewry. At the time of the 1848 revolution, we find that Bertolt Auerbach, Abraham Geiger's revolutionary friend, belonged, and so did the reform phony rabbi G. Solomon, to the Hamburg Temple, as well as Jacob Demberg, the jurist, a close friend of Abraham Geiger. Justice Hiller was appointed orator of the lodge. 
At its founding, his Antimonian leanings were evident in his address when he alluded to Frankist teachings. He was a delegate to the French Sanhedrin, along with a Westphalian banker, Israel Jacobson, which Abraham Geiger mentioned when he eulogized James Rothschild on November 29, 1868, as follows. A short time ago, we marked the 100th anniversary of the birth of Israel Jacobson. His abundant wealth would not have given him permanence to his name. He is remembered because he was a shield and protector of the brethren. Lavish in charity, he founded a school in which the new educational requirements of our time were linked with traditional heritage for the education of the rising generations. He built houses of worship in which the faith of Israel was to shine forth in purified form and to be preached in messages of inspiration. Therefore, his name will live forever. Geiger concluded his eulogy of James by urging the Rothschilds and all the other super-rich to emulate Jacobson, and if they did, he concluded that there will be a new radiance to illuminate the bright escutcheon of the house and to give an everlasting memorial to his name. So an escutcheon is like a coat of arms, a shield. In other words, Geiger was telling these people that by emulating Israel Jacobson, they could be good Illuminati. Indeed, Jacobson had been referred to as Jacobin, son of Israel, and Jacobson had served the Illuminatus Duke of Brunswick, sponsor of the Frankist Asiatic Brethren, as his financial agent, as well as Napoleon as his Westphalian banker. Actually, Jacobson may be regarded as the first self-made phony rabbi of the reform movement. He opened a very unique house of uh, quote-unquote Jewish worship in Kassel in 1807 called the Consister Altschul. On July 17, 1810, Jacobson introduced Christian practices into a Jewish service. He tolled a bell, he had an organ playing, and he delivered a sermon clothed in the robes of a Protestant minister. All the Christian practices he attributed to the influence upon himself of Mendelssohn. Jacobson's two heretical practices, the playing of an organ as part of the services and donning ceremonial robes of a, a Christian minister, are today indulged in by nearly all reform and most conservative temples. A few years later, Jacobson moved to Berlin, where he opened for the Shabbat holiday of 1815, Berlin's first reform synagogue. The reform clergyman Philipson claims Jacobson is the founder of reform and extols him, but somewhere along the line, Philipson, Encyclopedias, and other heralds of enlightenment have conveniently forgotten an interesting fact about Jacobson, and that is that the first reform service in Berlin was conducted in honor of Jacobson's son's bar mitzvah, and this son thereafter studied for and entered the Catholic priesthood. These facts should again serve to emphasize the persistent nihilistic and secular political character of the conservative and reform movements among Jews. Since Jacobson's day, little has changed. Antimonian so-called Judaisms continue to serve as assimilating factors and a destructive force against the intact survival of the Jewish religion. These same groups continue to Christianize Judaism and to Judaize Christianity with the ultimate aim of destroying these religious systems. As recently as March 25, 1973, a rally was attended by thousands of Jews in New York in front of the National Council of Young Israel on 3 West 16th Street entitled An Invitation to Indignation was presided over by prestigious rabbis representing religious American Jews. They expressed their, quote, indignation over the grave spiritual injury inflicted by conservative and reformed Jewish clergy's teachings and practices, leading to intermarriage and assimilation, end quote. Unfortunately, the media never carried the story, because it is controlled today, as it was after the Illuminati came to power, by interests that are dedicated to the destruction of authentic religious values, and that would never allow a news story to appear that would challenge the alleged authenticity of secular, political, quasi-religious, nihilistic sects. Little has changed since 1810. No sooner had Israel Jacobson infiltrated these reforms when Aaron Chorin, 1766 to 1844, came out in complete support of them and attempted their initiation. Chorin was a known Sebation and did most of his dirty work in Hungary, 
opening reform temples, and he abolished the Kol Nidre service of Yom Kippur, agitated for the desecration of the Sabbath day, and he actively promoted intermarriage and assimilation. So infamous did he become that people said that God created Satan in the image of Aaron Chorin. It was no wonder that in addition to his being excommunicated, he was once nearly stoned to death by a mob of pious Jews. The list of the Frankist elite is long, and if one spent the time to study just a few families mentioned here in depth, the information would fill several volumes. However, the same pattern continuously emerges. Brilliant, wealthy people addicted to power, anxious to assimilate, if they were born Jewish, to destroy religions, to indulge in radicalism, and to live cryptic, two-faced lives, sometimes posing as religious Jews, Catholics, or Protestants, but indulging in their own revolutionary radicalism in secret. Sholem informs us that the Frankists went underground around 1820, as their emissaries went from town to town and from family to family to collect their secret writings. In 1845, Wolfgang Wesley published Letters of a Sebation, detailing Frankist activity in Prague. As the years passed, the economic and intellectual position of the Frankists strengthened. They built factories and became active in Masonic organizations. They were known to have secret gatherings on the 9th of Av, which they celebrated as a holiday, which is the Jewish fast day commemorating the destruction of both temples. The center of Frankist activity changed from Frankfurt to Offenbach to Prague and then to Warsaw. The Frankists in Warsaw, who were now concentrated among seemingly Catholic families, maintained contact prior to World War II with the Turkish Donme Sebations, who were centered in Turkey and in Salonika, Greece. The Donme was active in the Committee for the Progress of Unity among the Young Turk movement. David Bay of the Donme was an important minister in the first Young Turk government. The Polish poet Adam Mikiewicz, 1795 to 1855, was from a Frankist family. He was a political radical and was imprisoned by the Russian government for some time. He associated with Goethe, and Mikowitz's poetry reflected paganism and mystical religious philosophy. From 1832 on, Mikowitz came to Paris, where he held some prestigious academic positions. However, his lectures deteriorated to radical political polemics, causing him to be censored by the French government. And while the Frankists appeared to have dominated Eastern European radical circles, they also found their way into other parts of Europe and to America. In the latter part of the 18th century, Samuel H. Falk, 1710 to 1782, a Sebastian and Frankist, came to London and established a laboratory devoted to alchemy and Kabbalah in London Bridge. His previous radical activity in Germany had caused him to be banished from Cologne by the city's archbishop. Falk's mystical activities were involved with the use of secret formulas for the name of God, which earned him the title of Baal Shem, or Master of the Name, of London. The Frankists indulged in this name because their archenemies were the Hasidic Jews, whose spiritual founder, Rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov, 1700 to 1760, earned his title by acclamation because of the good deeds he had done and his mastery of the Kabbalistic holy name of God, the Shemit Hakadoshim. It therefore is no wonder that when American artist John Copley painted Falk's portrait, that Frankists made duplicates of it and disseminated it all over Europe, from which they derived a sadistic pleasure of having substituted one of their ilk for the Baal Shem Tov. There are still many people today who erroneously believe Falk's portrait to be that of the Baal Shem Tov. Copley's painting can be found reproduced in the Encyclopedia Judaica. While Gershom Sholem seems to have lost the Frankists somewhere in Warsaw in the 1920s and the Don May in Salonika during World War II with the extermination of the Jews there, the author has found their descendants in the United States to be very active in Marxist, Leninist, and Third World activities. They have attempted to convert the civil rights movement into a black revolution and are attempting to further polarize the country by promoting women's liberation. Their children, who are prominent in the SDS organization, that's Students for a Democratic Society, and they are recruits for the El Fatah, 
They have succeeded in destroying synagogues and Jewish institutions by instigating black radicals, mostly concentrated in nine urban centers in the United States. And you guys, this is nothing new. We're seeing this in society today. We see how this chaos is unfolding, tearing our country apart. The Frankists today no longer call themselves by that name. The organization has grown into an international group labeled by outsiders as the cult of the all-seeing eye. So the SDS, the Students for a Democratic Society, morphed into the cult of the all-seeing eye. The Frankists today no longer incorporate the portrait of three religions through which they must pass to bring the, about the millennium. They have expanded from Judaism, Islam, and Christianity to six religions, adding on Buddhism, Confucianism, and Hinduism as well. In the United States, they are most active in Boston, New York, Washington, and San Francisco. Their ranks and sponsors include some very famous people, numbering diplomats, senators, governors, and clergymen in their ranks. And these people and their activities will be discussed at length in following chapters. In Jewish circles, they dominate the reform movement at many levels and the conservative movement at the highest level. The late reform clergyman Maurice Eisendroth and the conservative cleric Abraham Joshua Heschel belong to them. Eisendroth was always involved in communist causes and tried to sabotage the Zionist movement. Heschel was the hero of the New Left's Ramparts magazine and contributed articles to it. Heschel's book, The Prophets, is two-faced and crypto sebation and is used by this elite as a text because of its references to Neoplatonism, kings and priests, Greek and Babylonian cults. The other Jewish circles that they dominate are the Anti-Defamation League, the American Jewish Congress, and federations of Jewish charities in many American cities. One of their cliques of so-called Jewish lawyers are active in the subvertly oriented National Lawyers Guild. Their major projects currently include attempts by the American Jewish Congress to destroy the network of Jewish religious day schools in the U.S. and a newly formed women's activist group, the National Council of Jewish Women, which is agitating for women's rights and is attempting to use women's liberation to destroy the role of women in Judaism and the character and sanctity of Jewish religious services, such as an attempt to having women counted in prayer quorums. Jewish law does not require just 10 men for the quorum, but specifies 10 circumcised males. How they overcome the circumcision requirement is beyond comprehension. They also agitate for abortion on demand, which according to Judaism is murder, as well as for affirmative action hiring for special minorities. Lest any of the information developed here serve as an outlet for some form of overt, vicarious, or subtle anti-Semitism, or lest someone entertain such thoughts as, see what these Jews did? It should be pointed out that, number one, it was the desire of the Jews to overthrow the yoke of bitter Christian anti-Semitic persecution that led them to initially embrace Sabatianism from which Frankism evolved. Number two, once anyone embraced these ideologies, he ceased to be a Jew, and being a Jew only by birth or becoming a Jew in name only, J-I-N-O. Number three, the socialists and communists in Germany utilized the Frankist elite for their own ends, and when they served the cause, proceeded to exclude them from the millennium by expounding an anti-Semitic doctrine, which declared all Jews as belonging to the Jewish race. Baptisms, formal conversion ceremonies, or other means of escaping one's Jewish birth could never remove in the minds of these anti-Semites the taint of which they termed to be the Jewish racial contamination. So we have outlined relationships between Frankists and the Illuminati and the relationship of the groups which Mendelssohn's circle, which began the Haskalah movement. And we have shown how the Frankists embraced Mendelssohn's teachings and how his own inner circle that worked on the wire were involved with the Frankists and how his own disciples were involved with the Jacobins and how the Jacobins, who were derived from the Illuminati, were connected with the Frankists. We have traced the Illuminastic Frankist families who have formed the beginnings of the reform and conservative movements and the major elite families that were connected with them who together formed the inner circles of the Bundesrechten, which changed its name to the International Communist Party 
in 1848 and were active in the Communist Revolution in 1848. Before taking leave of the Frankist elite, we should point out that David Friedlander, 1750-1834, of Moses Mendelssohn's circle, was also prominent in the reform movement, and interestingly enough, in 1799, prior to the movement's creation, he wrote an anonymous letter to a pastor teller on behalf of several heads of Jewish families asking to be received into the fold of the Protestant church on conditions of their own. In the petition, they asked if they could be Christians without Christ. This reply sent to Friedlander was in effect that Christianity, which left Christ out, was meaningless. So while we know that the Frankists embraced Mendelssohn's works and that his circle were involved with them, and this is the question of Mendelssohn ever came directly in contact with the Frankists, but the answer to that question is a definite one. For Me Moses Mendelssohn met in Hamburg with Frankist Jonathan Ibeschutz in 1761, and interestingly enough, Ibeschutz wrote an essay extolling Mendelssohn, which appeared in 1838, long after his death, in a publication called Kerem Kamed. We can see from our study of the Frankists and their elite that they were truly monsters, and indeed the concept has been preserved and not by accident in their novel Frankenstein, which deals with the creation of the Frankenstein monster. Mary Shelley, the wife of the famous poet Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein, was a member, together with her husband, of the Illuminati. The symbolism inherent in the name Frankenstein is as follows. The word Frank stands for Jacob Frank, founder of the Frankists. The N is the anglicization and abbreviation of the three-letter Hebrew word Ayin, A-Y-I-N, which stands for I, and E resembles the first letter, and N is for the last, so E is for I, N is for Ayin. Stein in German stands for stone. In the symbol of the cult of the all-seeing eye as the great seal of the U.S. found on the American dollar bill, the eye stands over stones, forming the base of the pyramid. So Frankenstein is Frank I stone. But what is the symbolism of the Frankenstein monster? Well, as we've pointed out, the Frankists were tied in with mystical Kabbalism, and there is a Kabbalistic tradition of such monsters known as golems. The golem concept is discussed in detail in Professor Shulman's book, The Kabbalah and Its Symbolism, in Chapter 5, entitled The Idea of a Golem. In the classical construction of a golem, the Kabbalist forms a figure of a man out of earth or clay and writes one of the secret names of God on a parchment and places it in a cavity in the golem's head. After writing the proper formula, depending on which legend you care to follow, the golem is said to come alive. The cryptic symbolism of the Frankenstein monster is that the dead and decrepit ideas of the old world are to be given new life by great mystical savants, purveyors of wisdom who will harness the great secrets of the universe and destroy the old world and bring the millennium. In the novel, Frankenstein's creator studied at the same university that Adam Weishaupt, founder of the Illuminati, was professor at, Ingolstadt. Rasputin, who played a major role in the Russian revolutions, espoused a doctrine which was identical to that of the Frankists of redemption through sin. This will be discussed later in detail. Suffice it to say that the Frankists and their elite played a leading role in the development of communism and that they continue to be an elite today within the wider communist circles, but nevertheless tend to be standoffish, forming a clique within a clique as they did during the later 18th and early 19th centuries when they chose to make Illuminati Masonic lodges their stomping grounds. While the Frankists were standoffish and married among themselves, the feeling was quite mutual. Since it is known that the Zabatians and Frankists indulge in adultery, their children carried with them the taint of what is referred to in Jewish law as being in the category of mamzer, or bastardly. This is based on a verse in Deuteronomy, a mamzer shall not come into the congregation of the Lord, Deuteronomy 23.3 which prohibits marrying or admitting into the Jewish fold any progeny of incestuous sexual relations and adultery. 
Anyone who was a member of a Frankist or Sebastian family was shunned by the religious Jewish community. And in those days, many Jewish communities had what is known as a Sefer Yushin, or records of pedigree, which recorded the status of people that were converted from other religions into Judaism and kept records of illegitimate births, but not children born of Jewish parents out of wedlock, which, according to Judaism, has no taint of illegitimacy whatsoever. So, a double standard. It should be pointed out that the Frankists and their elite were not monolithic in character. They were people who were brought up in these circles that rebelled against their environment and sought to rectify their lives. One such example is Edmund Rothschild, son of James, who, contrary to the Reform and Frankist teachings, he embraced Zionism and he gave huge sums of money for the settlement of Israel and for maintaining institutions where authentic Torah values were retained and intensively pursued. And it was he who rebelled against the intrigues of the House of Rothschild, spurned Abraham Geiger's eulogy of his father and the teachings of Marx, Engels, and their radical friend Heinrich Hein, 1799-1856, whose patronage the Bund had assigned to Edmund's mother, Betty. While the bank of the Rothschild was growing by leaps and bounds, another banking interest, but not as large, was quietly developing. It was the Mendelssohn Bank, run by the brothers Abraham Mendelssohn, 1776 to 1835, and Joseph Mendelssohn, 1770 to 1848. Moses' son, Abraham Mendelssohn, married Daniel Itzig's granddaughter, Leah Solomon. He was the father of the musician Felix Mendelssohn. Abraham converted to Christianity in 1822, whereas his brother Joseph did not convert. Joseph's son, George Benjamin, 1794 to 1874, did. He incidentally was Karl Marx's professor of geography at Bonn. The Mendelssohn Bank was active in German and foreign railway issues and state loans. They were known as specialists in Russian securities. The bank persisted after World War I and was absorbed after Hitler came to power in 1939 by the Deutsche Bank. Among Mendelssohn's descendants were Felix Gilbert, the historian, the philosopher Leonard Nelson, 1882-1927, and more recently Kurt Hensel, a diplomat attaché from West Germany to Israel, who arrived in 1968. 